Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. I'm going to call the meeting to order. Uh, Mr. Lashley, yes. I think you have the honors. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for another wonderful, glorious day that you have created. Dear Lord, please give us the, the strength and wisdom to carry out the business for the citizens of Alamance County. And dear Lord, we know that all things are possible through you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Do I have a motion for the approval of the agenda? Um, I, so, I'll make a motion to approve the agenda with an amendment to move item 8.1 to our June 20th meeting. What's that called? The Elmhurst County uh, UDO okay. text amendment section 6.7, 6.14, and 7.2. Uh, Mr. Carter, why'd you want to move it? Well, I'll defer to Mr. Turner on that one. Uh, well, I, I think that's not a bad idea. We just got some uh, language amendments from legal this afternoon, which I, I mean, I've seen, I've read, but I don't fully appreciate how it changes the thing. I think sure. we ought to take it just a time to look at that and see what that does. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. If we don't remove it, I have some substantial changes to what has been proposed anyway. So I'll second your motion. Okay. You have changes, you said? But he's seconded that the motion. If we don't it. table it to uh, June, uh, June 20, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. What I'm saying is I've got have some substantial changes I want to make if we had left it on. I think it makes sense to sure. look at that over the next two weeks. Absolutely. Any other comments? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 <clears throat> Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Six point or eight point two, excuse me, eight point one has been removed from our agenda. Now motion to approve the amended agenda. Some uh, second. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. All right, we have two uh, agenda items, but uh, Mr. Morgan, uh, we just moved your section to June 20th. Do you still want to speak? Uh, no, I'll wait. There's no use taking your time. All right. And. Um, Uh, Mr. Prevent, um, yours is on the same item. Do you yes. wish to be heard at this point or wait until no, our meeting? We'll okay, thank you. The other speaker is a non-agenda item, so we are now beyond public speakers. Do we have a motion uh, as to the consent agenda? Motion to approve. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ms. Hook, on the uh, public hearing on the manager's recommended budget, I think you have two changes you want to be recognized for. I do. Thank you. Um, I was just going to remind the board that um, the manager's recommended budget and capital plan were submitted at the May 16th meeting. There are two fee changes that have been requested by the health department 
and approved by their Board of Health um, since that recommended budget was presented. So these changes are the elimination of the well camera inspection fee and a new service fee of $252 for Prevnar 20. And I think you guys had a, me a memo about that. We did. Thank you. Do we have a motion to open the uh, public hearing? So moved. Second. Motion second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous again. We are now in a public hearing. We have changed the public policy, um, and the public policy, as of voted on just a few minutes ago, is a three-minute speaking period per speaker. So three minutes, and we'll ask you to be uh, attentive to that. It'll be marked on the board on each side, so you'll know when your three minutes are running down and or your time is up. Um, so public hearing, so you did not have to sign up to speak at this public hearing. Uh, let's go to this side first. Are there public speakers on this side? If you will, raise your hand. All right. So we have three on this side. Is that clear? Is that correct? All right. Ma'am? All right. Every public speaker must, one, announce your name. You must give your address. And then... Uh, it's got to be about this item. It cannot be on items other than the agenda. Uh, excuse me, other than uh, budget. this budget. Um, and so we welcome your board. Sure. <coughs> Hi. Um, my name is Medora Burkskull, and my address is 3673 Mevin Rogers Road, Mevin. Uh, I come to you tonight as a representative of the Alamance Burlington Association of Educators but also as the Teacher of the Year for ABSS, um, to ask you to please keep our tax rate the same. Um, I noticed that in the uh, department's version, new version of the budget that ABSS would receive $1.3 million less than our budget, and ACC would receive $173,484 less. Um, and I would ask that you reconsider that budget recommendation, um, especially, I, I understand, like I'm a homeowner in this county and I don't like paying property taxes. Nobody likes paying property taxes, but the mean annual savings across Alamance County would be $30 a year. Um, at that point, it's, it feels a little performative um, instead of like real savings to our taxpayers. Um, I, also would like to advocate on behalf of the sheriff's department, losing two positions in a county that's already understaffed and underfunded um, doesn't feel like progress. Alamance County's growing. Um, every year, this county welcomes more people, welcomes more students to our school system, becomes a nicer place to live, and we can't have that growth without funding. Um, as the Teacher of the Year, I have the privilege of compiling monthly shout outs for our school district. Uh, we have amazing things happening in all 37 of our public schools. Um, and we, every month we compile something from every single school in the district, shouting out the great things that are going on in teaching and learning. If you guys aren't on that mailing list and you're not receiving that, please let me know because it's cool. Um, it's, it's just a slideshow of all the wonderful things happening in our quality public schools. And I'd love for you guys to see that. Um, I'd also like to add that ACC's line item budget should matter to all Alamance County residents. I was recently in a group uh, that went through ACC and toured their mechatronics program. I got to tour a whole bunch of programs and see how our students, because I'm a high school teacher, transition into community college and then transition into careers. Uh, and every single professor that we talked to mentioned that like they can't churn out qualified candidates fast enough to fill the roles that are open in the job market in Alamance County. It seems like cutting a budget of an institution that's filling these vital roles in our county and growing our economy with homegrown individuals um, is, is perhaps a misstep. Um, I love this county. I moved here almost 15 years ago to call this place home. And I just, like, I love seeing all the changes and the growth and the improvements going on. Um, I would, I guess, 
like to see that fully funded by our local government. And I appreciate your time. Thank you. And congratulations on your Thank you. I was that present for your presentation and award. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good evening. My name is Robert Alvis. Um, I'm a resident of 1869 Brevard Road in Graham, North Carolina. Um, County Commissioners, I hope that you're doing well this evening. I come before you tonight as a citizen of Alamance County to ask that you keep our tax rate the same and fully fund the requests of our county departments, including our public school system and Alamance Community College. As Medora just said, and as reported uh, by Isaac Groves on June 1st, the proposed budget provides ABSS with $1.3 million less than requested, ACC with $173,484 less than requested, and in total provides county departments with $9 million less than requested. All for the sake of saving the median household in Alamance $30 every year. Mr. Carter is a man of business. You know the phrase, you get what you pay for. And in this instance, I ask that we pay for quality county government that meets the needs of its citizens, young and old, rich and poor. A shortfall like this proposed budget does not align with quality service from our county government. In the same article, County Manager Sherry Hook has recorded as saying that raises for county staff is a priority as our department heads are struggling to keep staff in a competitive economy. I admire and agree with Ms. Hook's assessment and intent. County governments all over North Carolina are competing with one another to hire from a scarce employee pool. Providing a competitive salary is one step towards making Alamance County a more attractive place to work among its competitors, among its many other advantages. However, while paying a competitive salary is important, so is the quality of working conditions and the support given from commissioners. All else being equal, if I had a choice between working for a county commission that fully funded its department request versus one that shortchanged it, I know which one I would choose. Ms. Thompson, I know as a former school board member that you know how important the quality of a school environment is and what a difference $1.3 million can make for our school system in that regard. Just as an example, part of the ABSS budget proposal allotted technical support for our media center coordinators, which is vital. We are losing qualified individuals from these positions left and right due to them not having the support they need. And should the county not meet the requests, our school system may not be able to afford that technical support. And we would find our schools still losing their qualified media center coordinators. I'm sure other county departments experience similar circumstances. Along with salary, the allotment in every yearly budget is essential to making their departments a desirable and sustainable place to work and an attractive place for new hires. To fully meet the budget requests, which does not require increasing taxes, only keeping them the same, is to show faith and trust in the professionalism of those who made those requests. I came here tonight with faith that you all have open minds in the interest of our county and all of its citizens at heart. Thank you and God bless. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Mr. Bynes, I think you are next. You, you know you're infamous already when I know your name before you say <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mason. Uh, my name is Henry Vines, and uh, I'm a resident at 3450 Isley Drive, farmer here in the county. Uh, tonight I'm asking for a tax reduction. Uh, I stood before you last year, asked for two cents, and um, seemed like you had a hard time doing that. And then we come up this year with a $14 million surplus and we filled up the fund balance, 38 million plus, and then we took five million of that and put in to capital improvement, in which Mr. Last I heard you say, what are we gonna spend that money on? It seems like we save money, we make money, we are doing good in this county. Our financial stability in this county is, is really good, but it's, we're being overtaxed. We, uh, give permission to the county to uh, issue bonds for the school and the stuff. And at that time, we were taxed eight cents uh, to help to pay for that bond. At that time, that was $1.2 million, which come to about $9.6 million, which was gonna cover the debt load that we would be incurred. Well, when that uh, bonds have been issued, now it's just a little less than eight million dollars so at that time so we're collecting 1.6 million dollars more than what was needed well we fast forward to now that same penny is generating over eight cent 12 
$1.8 million because the penny now is $1.6 million because of the growth in the county. Our, our tax base has increased, and yet we, as the taxpayers, see no results from that benefiting us. You know, if we're growing and, and we got more income coming in, why should we keep our tax rate the same? And uh, as the gentleman was talking about funding, well, I think y'all are funding it very well at eight and a half percent increase, second second largest uh, taxing, I uh, mean, budget increase in two years. I understand you got to meet the needs of the county, but you also, you know, don't need to get more than you need. Um, so why do I think we could, you could do this? Well, five million right there that could have been left in the general fund you could have used on this year's budget instead of putting in capital improvement. Well, that in itself is a three cent cut. Then we have three and a, a little over $3.7 million been in the bank for over a year now. This got no designation to it. Could be given back to the taxpayers. Um, five million, the, the five million that, that we have. Then we have uh, 3.2 million on the bond. If we went with the same thing, the nine million, and I appreciate it. I was used to five minutes instead of three. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Clark. <laughs> Dr. Gatewood, did you want to be recognized, sir? I will, certainly. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, thank you for the opportunity to say just a few words with you. And I'll speak it in sort of in general terms, if that's okay. The Alamance Community College has a budget request in front of you. And that is a very realistic request. We need that funding level in order to keep us sustained as an institution. I want to remind you of something that I've said to you many times. And that is, for every dollar invested, the return on that investment is $4.40. Reality is that that's actually going up now to about $8 for every dollar invested. The economic impact of Alamance Community College is roughly $200 million a year. So when you invest in our college, you will get a return on that investment, a huge return on that investment. I don't want to use much levity, but that is part of who I am. If I had that kind of return <laughs> on the little investments that I have, someone else would be speaking with you this evening because I would have so much money I wouldn't know what to do at that type of return on investment. I also want to mention that this, we are in a very unique location in our county, in our, in our state for that matter. We're between two of the largest metros in the state and there is a lot of industrial development around us and in this county. <clears throat> we have all the good things going on in our county. We have boom. We have VinFast to the south of our county. We have Toyota Manufacturing back, um, and the uh, Battery Manufacturing Company. Collectively, they will employ thousands of people. That's huge. Now here's the deal. People from Alabama County will need to be well-trained and educated to get some of those jobs to bring that money back here to our county to invest in the tax base. We want at least I want, and I think many of you will agree, that we want our people here to be as well trained as possible. Not only will we be able to participate in the wonderful thing that's going on here and around us, but we'll be able to attract more industry. When industry considers a place to locate, community colleges are one of the first institutions that they look at. And, and the reason for that is they all want trained workforce. We can do it with your help. We need to have 21st century facilities. I'm reminded of something a recent governor of North Carolina said, and I agree with him wholeheartedly, that you can't provide 21st century training for 25th century facilities. So we have the facilities, but we have to maintain those facilities. And we have to invest in our college. 
So remember, when you make an investment in Alamance Community College, it's not just us. It's everybody in this room, and it's everyone in this county. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else on this side of the room? This side of the room. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Good evening. Hold on one second. I'm sorry. Um, thanks for the opportunity to present this information. Um, I have some copies of some things that I can give to each one of you um, if you'd like it. That would be fine. I am Mia Bosna, and I live at 1616 Bancroft Court in Graham. I didn't catch your name. I'm sorry. Mia Bosna. Okay. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. You're all yeah. for non-budget. Uh, is this about the budget? Or is it, it is not. Okay, then you have to wait until later. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, There's part. I misunderstood. <laughs> yeah. Sorry this about is, that. This is a open <laughs> meeting for the budget only at this Thank point. Thank you. You will be called later. Okay. Anybody else on this side of the room regarding the budget? Ms. Graves. And I planned for five, so I'm going to talk really fast. <laughs> <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> um, Sandy Ellington Graves, 6349 Whitney Road, Graham. Good evening, Chair Paisley and Commissioners. I am a member of the school board currently serving as board chair. I am the mother of a student at Southern High School, and I have five nieces and nephews in ABSS. I am a lifelong resident of Alamance County, where I have been a local real estate broker for the last 20 years. As an elected official, a mother, an aunt, a citizen, and a small business owner, I see firsthand the value in public education. I start by saying thank you. During my 18 months on the school board, and particularly over the last six months as board chair, this board of commissioners has shown consistent support for ABSS. Chair Paisley, your willingness to meet monthly with me and the superintendent is appreciated. You and your board colleagues have welcomed engagement from members of the school board. The collaboration between the commissioners and the school board is meaningful in many ways for the people in Alamance County. Thank you. In February, ABSS received over $8.4 million above and beyond the already approved 2021-2022 budget to support unfunded capital projects impacting four elementary schools and two high schools. In addition, $500,000 was used to install much needed security cameras in the last four middle schools as identified by ABSS and immediately addressed by the Board of Commissioners. Thank you. As part of the 2022-23 budget recommendation, ABSS will receive over $50 million, including $945,000 to expand funding for our school district. Your continued generosity to ABSS is acknowledged and appreciated. Thank you. It is my understanding the commissioners landed at 945,000 with the intent to support the board's request for four additional school resource officers at 245,000 and 700,000 in supplements. Thank you for your continued commitment again to school safety and to the support of our educators. The school board is now tasked with the difficult decisions of identifying its spending priorities for the upcoming year. We meet again June 14th and I anticipate continued budget conversations. Tonight I speak to you ahead of those budget conversations and in light of the tragic school shooting and excuse me, in Texas, which sharpened a focus on school safety. ABSS is working diligently to ensure all schools have security vestibules and security cameras installed. In addition to date, 21 of our schools have full-time SROs. Personally, I support an SRO on every ABSS campus. The cost to fully fund the 14 part-time SROs would require an additional $767,000 since 213,000 is already employing Oh, them on a part-time basis. The current ABSS expansion budget request included four of these positions at 245. If I apply that 245 as the Board of Commissioners desired, then the school system would need an additional $522,000 to have a fully funded SRO at every school. It's a lot of money, yet it would allow every single school in this district to have a full-time school resource officer. Let me slow you down and stop the clock. Um, I share under the new procedures that we just passed, give, it gives me the authority to extend time. Bless you. Uh, <laughs> if we as a board agree to this one speaker to extend time. Yes, absolutely. Agree? Yes. Agree? Yeah. Thank and you. And I have copies for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
As a board member, if I shift my support to fund SROs, I struggle with... we like the pay? No, I'm kidding. (laughs) (laughs) As a board member, I shift my support to fund SROs. I struggle with less than $200,000 available to support our educators. While ABSS is proud to rank within the top 10 school districts across the state in teacher supplements, it is important to always remain mindful of those districts around us with higher teacher supplements. At present, ABSS has 118 teacher vacancies. That is 118 teacher vacancies in 86 days before the new school year. As a board member, I believe school safety and teacher supplements are both top priorities. We must position our district to do both, recruit and retain talented educators, and provide the safest learning environment we can. Our new superintendent here with us this evening has also indicated his top, pro- top two priorities are school safety and supporting our teachers. When students don't feel safe, they cannot learn. When teachers do not feel supported, they cannot thrive. Tonight I ask you to delay your budget vote to allow the school board to meet next week to discuss spending priorities, particularly around school safety and teacher supplements. In the interim, I welcome your input. Please know that I do recognize leadership is finding the balance between emotion and reason to make the difficult decisions to create the greatest impact. But how do you choose between two priorities that are equally important? Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. And we thank you. If you need some water, there's a spare one right there. (laughs) Thank you. Ms. Graves, I apologize for the poor joke about the speeds. (laughs) Thank you for the extra time. Uh, any other speakers on this side of the room? Are there any, is there anyone in the annex? There's at least one. All right. Is that the only speaker from the annex? Thank you, County Commissioners. Okay. If you'll state your name and address, please. Yes, my name is Brett, and I live at um, 104 Cone Drive in Hall River. Thank you all for having us tonight. Um, Many, I know you all know this, but many people here might not know that Alamance County does not currently have a public defender's office. I'm part of a group of citizens called the Campaign for One Legal System in Alamance County, and we believe in the Sixth Amendment right to have the assistance of counsel for one's defense. Without a public defender, many folks attend their pretrial hearing without representation in our county, um, or they await in jail for much longer than others awaiting trial, unaware of their rights. The presence of an active public defender's office ensures that everyone charged with the crime is represented at a pre-trial hearing and when bail is set. Our petition currently has over 500 signatures to have this um, introduced. In our conversations with commissioners, legislators, and judges, it has become clear that one of the largest barriers to getting a public defender's office is the initial cost. And we were hoping that part of the budget could consider investing in a public defender's office because in the long run a public defender's office is more economically efficient than a private appointed council which is what Alamance County currently has. Um, they ex- Counties that have a public defender's office experience lower costs and better outcomes over time with a public defender's office um, and they also it, our citizens would have better representation. Um, Looking at the proposed budget, we saw that there would be a total increase of 10.3% across the board, although not equally, and saw that um, the sheriff, jail, and SROs were slated to receive more than that. So we were hoping that some of the budget could be shuffled to support potentially investing in a public defender's physical office, even if that's in the new courthouse, which I know is considered to be built. Um, um, What myself and others from our group have been able to determine from our own research about Alamance County is that our jail does not currently offer outdoor an outdoor recreational facility, which is necessary for the health and well-being of those detained. And we are hoping that 
some of the funds that are invested from this budget, which we know is over the 10.3% average, could potentially be reallocated to a public defender's office, which again would also support fewer people awaiting their trial in jail, which would also save the county some money. <laughs> um, and so yeah, we hope you'll hear the pleas from over 500 of our citizens to invest in our communities, schools, and public in institutions. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. If you will, you did not give us a last name. If you'll give oh, that sorry. last name to you. I'm sorry. S sorry about that, I forgot. <laughs> okay, if you'll give us your last name, I'd appreciate it. Yes, it's um, kind of long. It's Rapkin Citronbaum. That yeah. Well, no. <laughs> I wouldn't have heard. No. <laughs> um, it's, I can spell it. It's R R A P K I N hyphen C I T R E N B A U M. Got you. It's okay. Ever. <laughs> that's a, that's a really good last name. Thank how long you. did it take you when you were growing up to learn how to? <laughs> it it um, actually made me not get my library card till I was in third grade because I had to write it myself. So thanks to the library card. Librarians for sticking with me. <laughs> and Miss Graves, the... you indicated you had a handout. She did. I gave it's, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? Do we have a motion to close the open meeting? Motion to close. Second. A motion second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed is unanimous. Thank you. We are now back at our regular meeting. <laughs> I'll probably publicly want to thank everybody. I was afraid this would be a long session. So <laughs> and we all thank you. I'm disappointed that it's not. Oh yeah. <laughs> Straight up. I was hoping there are 100 people being here tonight to tell us yeah. what they want this budget to happen because it's serious. It's, it, it affects our community. Every single person. It affects every single person. I don't understand why there's not hundreds of people in here telling us what they want to do. Be careful what you get. Uh, John. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Like when is the moment that we get to ask a question about something on the budget that we want to be considered different? We are back in that section, so okay. right now will be yeah. the time. And well, you have the floor. First. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Let me get my pen ready. Okay. Um, well, the first thing I want to tackle is about the sheriff's office. Um, I had met with Sherry um, when we were all meeting with you individually about the budget. I was first, and big deal. And so, uh, and I had seen where the sheriff was requesting three forensic detectives, and I'll, I'll probably screw his name up, but anyway, that's what it was for. And so. Um, I, I recently know that there are detectives for the Davidson County and Alamance County Sheriff's got a national award uh, because of the forensic involved with a kidnapped victim that also some of these, I think this person was trying to get involved with some of the ABSS students or students in this county. And if it hadn't been for forensic detectives, I don't know what would happen to this kid. But the, the I, I'm going to be nice what I'm going to call him. But anyway, he's no longer with us. And, um, and so this child was saved, and I'm sure every day of her life is going to remember what she went through. This is a horrendous trauma, but she's alive and she's going to be okay, I'm sure. Um, I think it's so important, the fact that how this worked, the fact that they can get in somebody's cell phone, get in somebody's laptop, ASAP when they're doing an investigation, and solve all kind of horrendous crimes. And I don't know about you, but right now, our country seems to be on fire with horrendous crimes. We can't, it's just every day when you watch the news, you think, what next? It's, it's just absolutely awful. And I mean, it's, it's just something else. And so I had asked Sherry for permission, because I would never assume that 20% of this commission board has any power. And so I went over and spoke with the sheriff, and I asked him point blank, I said, how important are these, these positions to you? Because I know trying to stay ahead of crime is just about impossible. And if we're not prepared and have the depth in our law enforcement, I'm talking across this county, we're never going to get even caught up with it. And so I asked him, um, I said, is this a hill for me to die on? And I feel like it is because I am very much supportive of these three positions. And I asked him, I said, um, I, w I was kind of bargaining or trading out. I said, would you be willing to drop the SRO captain? Because we're looking at you know law enforcement in our schools. SROs are amazing. Chad Laws, he's awesome and maybe cut down on some of the Durangos, I said, to even out that cost for these three positions. And he said, absolutely. And he told me that he's got other funding that could compensate to catch the cars up, Durangos, if he needed to. And I thought that was wonderful. 
And then when I saw it was just one position, um, I said, you know, I'm going to have to say something about this. Um, we talk about all this money we got, and it's not our money. It's everybody that walks the ground in this county's money. That is who owns the checking account to this county. I mean, our citizens have ownership in this. They run the bank, so to speak. But I, I just don't think at this point in time that we can just not be visionary leaders, be visionary people in this county to realize that we have got to step it up and get the kind of law enforcement, this high tech technology that we need to keep us as safe as possible. I know maybe the last year I was on the board, we had a student that was allegedly going to harm kids out of Eastern and he was going to be this sniper and this, this made a tremendous difference but it took a while to find out what was going on for this young man. In the meanwhile when cell phones started going off and telling parents what they'd heard because communication will sink you or it will make you, every parent comes to the school <coughs> and every parent's out in the open. It was a nightmare because if, if I was going to harm somebody, boy I could just have a field day with right there. We've had gangs to make threats at schools before and when parents get wind of it because children get frightened and they should, nobody's going to keep me from my kid. I understand that. We've watched that this couple of weeks down in Texas. And I promise you, Uvalde, Texas never thought they would be on TV for this. They never thought their police chief would be talking, their, their superintendent would be talking, their parents would be talking. And when your children that you think are in danger, you will do anything for them because that's what we're supposed to do. That's why we have them is protect them for everything they've got. So whenever I've seen this, I really wanted to bring this to attention. I called the sheriff and asked him, and he gave me a bunch of stats, which you guys have the folder. And um, it's just talking about the murders and things. We unfortunately had a double murder where it was a teacher involved. How in the world did this happen to this man? I heard he was absolutely an amazing teacher, but you never know what goes on in the life of someone and the choices and mistakes that they can make. But in 2021, there's been like 12,364 um, phone extracts to where they could find the movement of a suspect and locate them and zero in on them before they ever pointed a gun at anybody. You know, prevention, when I was a community educator for Family Services and Crossroads, I used to always say prevention is so much cheaper than intervention because after the damage has been done, we're reacting. We got to get our heads around to stop reacting and be proactive. But if we have to react, we have got to be so ready. It won't take whatever we got, we can do it. Um, so I really am encouraging this to happen and also about SROs. Um, I know when I was on the board for eight years, every year I was begging and asking for full SROs of school because I thought about outlying schools, that the response time to get to them, if someone for whatever reason went to harm someone, it could really be devastating. I was at um, Pleasant Grove teaching <coughs> junior achievement, watching chickens hatch. It's a big deal when you're little. Second graders, they all look like little jack-o'-lanterns because the tooth fairies having a field day with this age. Teeth missing, they're just precious. And uh, I got there for the class and uh, Miss Lambert said, amazing principal, she said, we're gonna have a lockdown drill today. And I thought, lockdown? I, she said, do you wanna wait outside? I said, no, because I wanna see what this means. Because I know we have fire drills all the time and I don't think we hear of many schools burning up with fire. They may have a fire in a school, but it's not like what we're talking about with school shootings. And I was in that classroom when she came on that intercom and she said, go into you, whatever, the whole thing. I am under a round table with a bunch of second graders in a corner with a teacher that I'd put her up against any terrorist in the world. She was tough as nails, the size of this pen. And, and all of a sudden, we're sitting there. They don't say a word. They so know what to do because of the training, the prevention these kids have had. Second graders, this is the entire school at Pleasant Grove. And all of a sudden, it's as quiet. It's like nobody's in the school. And you're sitting there and you hear that <laughs> And I'm under that table, and I'm hearing this, and I'm looking at that old wooden door with a glass pane in the middle of it with a piece of construction paper put over it, and I'm thinking it wouldn't take one second to get rid of that door to come in here and kill all of us. And that's my concern about our school safety and our school buildings and what we have. We can't have one school with all kind of door locks, can't have one waiting to have the door locks. We have got to get it together and have the safety in our schools, every school, because every child that walks into the door of every school is absolutely priceless. We can't pick or choose which one mean one because they all do. 
And so I really want us to think about this, getting SROs across the board. Whatever the school system has to do, whatever the county has to do, whatever we have to do as a team, because we are in the same business, no matter what our titles are. We're in the same business of keeping this county safe, giving our children opportunities to grow up and assume the next leadership, because that is the raw talent of what a leader does. They are to create the next set of leaders. And so I really, we're gonna have to be tough on this and really figure out a way that we can cover all of our schools, city, county, whatever, they're all priceless. I know Burlington's short, but thir what, 30 officers down, that's difficult. We're gonna have to kind of go for each other, whatever it takes to do that, because our children matter. And the last thing is just, hmm. I want us to think about our parks and rec because I saw that $50,000, we got that last year. Um, I met with Brian and somebody else, <laughs> and, we, and somebody else, and we talked about the $2.5 million that Brian had talked about for improvement of all our ballpark parks. And I'm sure that out at Silva and out at AO, out at wherever these ballparks are, when I was a kid and a long time ago, but not maybe too long ago for some, those ballparks were full. They had parents there, they had kids there, they were playing, the concession stand worked, the bathrooms worked, and all of the stuff, and that is real community. We are coming off COVID. I was listening to the stats this morning about the mental delay and the depression and the anxiety and how far behind our children have fallen for the last two years due to remote learning and isolation. We are not meant to be by ourselves. Even Eve got created for Adam. It started from the very beginning. And I'm just saying, we need to think about improving these ball fields and doing what it takes to rise that up so those part of the county can really have their recreation, can have their families, can have their community. Because when you start to see these communities falling because they don't have a focus, it's the same as when belts and pennies leave them all. Those are your anchors and they will fold. So I want us to really figure out a way that we can do this for our county because parks and recs is like the stepchild. They always get just enough to fix that set of steps. But I encourage us to really consider putting them up there for a while because they have covered us so many times during COVID and I really think it's their time. So I, I think that's all. If I remember, I will, I will tell you. But I think that's all. <laughs> yeah, under our new procedure. Did I just mess up? I don't think so. Okay, good. <laughs> Under our new procedure, each commissioner gets a uh, point to speak on any and all items, but will not be interrupted, one, and the other speakers, uh, commissioners, will not interrupt that speaker either. So, Mr. Lashley, you're second. I don't even know where to start, John. I'm going to try to be as focused as I possibly can. I, like Ms. Thompson, think that the one thing that I'm actually responsible for is safety and security of my citizens. So therefore, the citizens that go to our school need to be protected as well. But I've been that way the whole time. Um, I believe that between the school board and this board, we should be able to take care of this problem. We should not have a problem to, taking care of that. Now, I, I hope the taxpayers understand that your taxes aren't going to go up, but we are going to have to spend some money that we didn't really think we were going to have to to take care of this problem. And it needs to be taken care of. Um, I, like Ms. Thompson, when I saw that on the TV two weeks ago, broke me in half. Couldn't sleep that night. As a matter of fact, I woke up at 6.30 in the morning, you know the first person I wanted to talk to? My sheriff. And I called him and he picked up the phone and we talked. And he talked me off the ledge because I was ramped up, ready to go. Let's get this started, it's going now. So I hope that the taxpayers understand that we're gonna to have to spend some money to take care of this. But I believe that we can do it in such a way in which it's not going to, um, it's not going to, um, we're not gonna to have to raise taxes. That's all I'm gonna say, we're not gonna to have to do that. Um, you know, John, I could go on for two hours here. Um, I have a lot of things in this budget that I don't like. I have a lot of things in this budget that I do like. Well, my problem with this budget is I know too damn much about it. 
I've been looking at this thing since February. I've been trying to work with the school system since they are, I'm a liaison to that board. Uh, I wanted the school board to know that I wanted to work with them. I wanted to solve problems. I'm not interested in causing problems. I'm interested in solving problems. Um, I know I have another couple of weeks to work through this budget, uh, but I firmly believe that we should, like Mr. Vine said, we need to take a hard look at our taxpayers. We need to take a hard look at this budget. Uh, there's a lot of things in our budget that we can tweak to make it a little more a little more friendly. When I say friendly, friendly in the sense of understanding it, friendly and understand that the taxpayer can pay for it. Um, but I promise the taxpayers of this county that I will continue to work hard and look out for them because at the end of the day, that's who, that's, that's who makes all this happen. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple of points. The first is to reiterate what Chairman, I mean, what uh, Commissioner Thompson and uh, Commissioner Lassie have said. I want to thank uh, Chairwoman Graves for her presentation and for Dr. Butler and Mr. Teeter and Dr. Merrill being here. Uh, that means a lot. Um, we we need to get we need to get 14 SROs in the schools that don't have SROs. But not only that, there are SROs uh, and part-time positions at elementary schools. Some elementary schools, not all. Um, I think we need to look beyond the 14 schools that don't have SROs and to the, the schools to make sure that all schools have a permanent SRO, but not only an SRO just to fill the spot, an SRO that's part of the team. Part of the team at a school who's respected, who is um, used as a member of the team. SROs provide safety, yes, but they also provide an opportunity for particularly young kids to develop a positive relationship with law enforcement to say, that person is on my side, that person cares about me, and if kids learn that at an early age, um, hopefully they'll carry that with them throughout, um, throughout their lives. Um, so I think we need to look at those things, and I would just encourage the school board to, to look at that and to ask us for what you need. That's what I would say. And then don't, don't worry about offending. Ask us for what you need, and then it's on us. Um, the other thing I would, I, would, I would say, and this is kind of a question to uh, to county manager, um, and it's kind of an odd place to go, but but th there are there are nonprofits that are that we provide money for that are in the budget. Some come from the ARPA funding, some come from occupancy tax, which is a three percent tax that we apply um, to hotels um, when people stay in the county. That statutory has to go to a particular place and can't go anywhere else. Do we have any mechanism as part of county government for tracking how the money that we provide those organizations gets spent to ensure that it's being spent as the commissioners uh, would like it to be spent? Mm -hmm. So um, we have a finance team that works on the front end of that, but I would say that um, we are tracking expenses, but we are not tracking to say, um, we're not necessarily tracking about outcomes. And that is the piece that we probably need to spend a little bit more time on. We just don't have the staff to, to constantly ask for reporting on outcomes. Um, like occupancy tax, the, the, rec the money is to promote tourism in the county. Um, we don't have a way really to, to know whether that money that we're spending is promoting Tourism. We have not been in a position to ask. You know, we ask, how are you spending your money? But we have not asked them for statistics on, you know, are you spending it in the best way possible? What are the results that you're getting from the money that you spend? There are nonprofits in the county that are very good at that. Um, United Way comes to mind. Have we ever had conversations with them about assisting us with something like that? We, we have talked to United Way about that in the past. They are willing to do that. We've just not gone as far enough down the road to see. I know that there would be some administrative cost to United Way to do that, and we've not gone down the road to see what that would be, but they are well skilled in that. They do that all the time. I think it would be worth it to explore that. Um, I think, I mean, uh, the nonprofits that are in the budget that are where the money is coming from sources other than the general fund, I think, I think it's valid. But I also think it's good to have a mechanism that we know how that money's being spent. And I think it would be worthwhile to engage 
some organization like the United Way to make sure that that's that money's being spent appropriately and I think it might make sense to have that in place before approving the budget I, I don't know that we can determine before passing it that money spent previously is is going in a proper place but perhaps we can condition money going to these folks once the budget's approved to making sure that the money in the past has gone in the right place right okay. and so um, we can definitely do that it it may mean that it's a little bit it may take a little bit of time to get that arrangement right. set up with United Way so or, or somebody else or yeah. yeah but it just remember it may take a little bit of time to do that and so I don't know you know commissioners may consider do you want to hold off <clears throat> approve the funding but hold off on actually giving the funding until that mechanism is in place or just have us work on it in the back end knowing that that's what we'll be working towards and those agencies would know that's what we're working towards I'd be appreciative of staff's opinion on that maybe next next meeting okay. that's all thank you mr. Chairman. mr. Carter. oh boy okay um, we're just making notes here while we were taught well while everyone was talking there's not a lot left on the table <laughs> um, ACC I happen to be privileged to sit on the Board of Trustees for ACC as a part of my role here and uh, they're going to be trying to train people for some jobs that don't even exist right now and the numbers if you want numbers the Toyota we, I, I've also been assigned to the work source development board at resources and we learned last, a week before last that the Toyota plant's going to drop from 2,500 to about 1.7 thousand employees. But VinFast in Chatham is going to be about 7,500 employees. So you're looking at about 9,200 employees that are going to be coming from someplace. And we're they're, both of those locations are a stone's throw from our border. Um, and the better the better we have our citizens trained the better they're going to be prepared for those jobs so yes we need to take a look at what abss needs uh, acc needs abss unequivocally when i ran when i ran in 2008 for the first time in 2018 one of the one of the things i stood for in that campaign was to try and have an sro in every school and we aren't there yet and I don't like the fact that we're not there yet. We we pared out budgets every year, and we're not there. Now, folks, I can guarantee you, anybody in this room, any citizen in this county, if we had one of those happen in Alamance County because we didn't have an SRO in the school or an SRO might have been able to save some of the lives, there'd be, excuse my French, there'd be hell to pay and I'd be leading the pack. That's just, that's just really not a permissible item any longer in this world. We live in a world, and I'm gonna go to evangelizing here in a minute. But we live in a world taken over by evil. And you watch the evil that we face each day and you watch it, you see what's happening all over, and not, not don't worry about Texas, don't worry about Pennsylvania, don't worry about Buffalo, New York. Look at North Carolina. Look at Forsyth County. They had more shootings this weekend when we got back than I could even keep track of. Guilford County. Um, we've been fortunate. We've been very fortunate in Alamance County. We have really good law enforcement in Alamance County and we are, we are holding our sheriff's feet to the fire by restricting his staffing to where it He's working with the least he can work with to try and get the job done. <coughs> SROs are, are just in my mind are something we have to have in every school. If we have to do it through the sheriff's office to make it happen, I think we should be able to get it done between ABSS, Mebane, Graham, Burlington, and Alamance County. And so one of the things I'd like to propose is sometime between now and the time we have to vote on this budget, we have a joint meeting with the ABSS board after they've had a chance to rethink what their needs are and kick this around and see if we can't come up with a better idea of what we actually need to do. Another thing I'd like to see us do, talk about what the sheriff's needs are. 
We can't do anything about Burlington Police, any of the other municipalities, police agencies, but we can make sure that we continue to have the best staffed and equipped sheriff's department in the state. And we should be, that should be a desire we have. I mean, it, it, we just can't afford not to. Now, as to whether or not we need to cut the budget or not, or, cut, or do a tax cut, I don't know why we had almost 60% of the vote, if I remember correctly, and Thomas will probably correct me if I'm wrong, approved the bonds for ABSS and ACC. But they didn't approve a way to pay for it. Now, a quarter percent tax, I kicked this around with Tom Boney one, night, one afternoon. He admitted to me that he thought it might be as, many, as much as 25% of the sales tax in Alamance County is paid from outside the county. I've heard numbers as high as 60%. At that point in time, we would have been able to look at possibly 20, 30, 40, 50% of the repayment of our debt from citizens traveling through Alamance County instead of having to increase our property tax. Now we had to do something to prepare to pay for the debt. You can't issue debt without a repayment source. So you're looking at the only surviving member, and I don't mean that, that, that not quite as gruesome as it sounded, but the only remaining member of that board that voted for that eight cent tax increase. And folks, I spent my life fighting taxes. I led the Tea Party here for 13 years. No more taxes. Taxed enough already. I can't remember how many times I've said that. And here I sat on a board there. I had to vote to increase our property tax. And you don't think I've gotten flack from that? I have, but we didn't have a choice. We had to pay the debt. Now, when I look at what's going on right now, we know that the debt service on the ABSS portion of the debt is going to be about 1.69 cents lower than we had budgeted for. However, we don't know what the impact of interest rate increases are going to be on the remaining bonds for ABSS. So we don't quite know yet what the impact of that is. And the other piece of this equation, folks, is what's going on in our economy and what's going on in Washington, D.C. If we aren't screwed to the wall right now, nobody is. I mean, just put one right through my abdomen and stick me in that wall back there. That's where we are. I mean, the economy with a 4% increase in the Fed rate, if it doesn't go into a recession, we are going to be unbelievably blessed. Unbelievably blessed. We have no idea. I know that with our guidance, the proposed budget has been pared down to an increase in, in sales tax revenue of less than 5%. Well, I'm not sure we'll get that. I'm not sure we'll see an increase at all. I'm not sure we won't see a decline in sales tax revenue, but we don't know. And the, a lot of economists right now, if you read the media, a lot of well-known conservative economists are saying, we got a reset, we're set up for a recession, it's coming, just we don't know how big and bad it's gonna be. So when you talk about giving back capital funds or giving back money that's in the reserves, that's where you survive when there's a downturn in the economy. If you give it away, you can't claw it back but one way, and that's with the property tax increase. And I can guarantee you we don't want to go there. So, I mean, there have been ideas of, there was a proposal for a public defender's office. I don't know much about that. We've got two lawyers on the board, the wife of a lawyer on the board, that knows a whole lot more about what a public defender's office would be all about than I do. Um, but guess what? Who do you think pays for that? <clears throat> you do. So if we want to do it, taxpayers are going to have to pay for it. The forensic analyst, I agree with what Ms. Thompson said. With the crime we're trying to protect ourselves against, the service we're providing to other agencies right now from our sheriff's office, the one forensic analyst we have is overworked, and I'm not sure we have. Have I heard something about the fact that we might have lost him, or? 
always that possibility. Well, we can't afford that either. Um, and and I'm just I'm just skimming the surface here. Um, I mean, I've puzzled over this budget like the rest of you have, and there's a lot of things I'd like to see changed in it too. Um, I'd like to, I'd, there's nobody on this board that wants any more than I do to give back a tax cut. And I can see a lot of justification if everything floats along as it's going for giving back a penny or more. But we don't know. There's nobody up here with a crystal ball. Not a one of us. We all rely on input from outside to try and make the best decisions we can for our citizens. And I know that's what I try to do, and I feel like I've, known, I've gotten to know these guys, the ones I didn't know before, well enough to think that's what they try to do as well. So this is probably going to be, from my perspective, the hardest budget I've ever had to look at. And i got a feeling it's going to be the hardest budget, hardest budget all of us have had to look at. And I just hope we come out of it in a solid, solid condition. Thank you. The good thing is I get to speak, and you know, other commissioners will have another opportunity, but I get to speak last. Uh, I wonder why I want to be chair. So <laughs> First off, I agree with all five, counting myself, commissioners, we've got to have safety. And I'm talking about ABSS, ACC, the Elements uh, Sheriff's Office, um, and, and just across the board. That is primary. Um, I'm going to encourage us. We could take a vote tonight, but I'm encouraging, you know, encouraging us at this point not to do that so that we can, as Ms. Graves asked, listen to the school board and see what their revised needs are. Uh, we know what your needs were prior to the Texas issue and the several others since then. But um, and Ms. Graves and I, by the way, had a, talked about setting up a meeting prior to this meeting, but we were unable to, um, you know, ridiculous things like Mr. Carter going on a vacation. Can you imagine? <laughs> and, and so forth. It wasn't my fault, it was hers. <laughs> right there, you blame her. Uh, but it was not, we were not able to do that. So we look forward to meeting with ABSS, hopefully prior to taking a vote. So therefore I'm encouraging us not to take a vote tonight. Um, but also, um, the tracing the nonprofits and knowing where the money's going and how it's being spent. Um, we unfortunately had a situation that we've just looked at as a group uh, where that hasn't always been the case. Um, and so I think that's a high priority. And uh, Ms. Hook, I would really encourage you to uh, have information for us prior to our next meeting, if possible. Um, Mr. Turner, thank you for that comment. Um, I agree with Mr. Carter. I think with the SROs, um, we the county are supporting an SRO for every school within the county, but we are not having SROs in every municipality school. So I think we, and Ms. Hook again, we're leaning upon you. So <laughs> we need to have a meeting with each and all of the municipalities uh, because they ought to be partially funding some of those uh, SROs in their city limits. Yes. Um, as to the tax cut, um, I plan at this point to support a one penny decrease. And Mr. Vines, I understand you and many others want more, but I am really afraid, as Mr. Carter just indicated, that we just had a recession for the first quarter of this year. June 30th ends the second quarter. We will have numbers again for the second quarter, and from everything I can see and predictions, and Mr. Lashley, you and I both look closely at those numbers. It appears to me we're going to have a recession again for the second quarter. Um, and I hope and pray that does not happen. 
but I'm not seeing anything other than that, at least at this point. Um, inflation is incredible. Our gas prices have doubled within the last 12 months. Um, food prices, baby formula, all kinds of things are just incredibly expensive um, and skyrocketing on a daily basis. Um, it was it yesterday or the day, be uh, day before, maybe it was today, whatever, I heard on the radio that the gas prices went up five cents in one day yep. and have gone up every day this past week. That's incredible. Um, I am truly concerned about what's happening at the federal level. I do not think that we can afford to blow all, and Ms. Myers, I agree, we've got a substantial uh, funding at this point, but I am really afraid. Uh, by the way, the uh, tax, initially, the um, administration proposed a 9 cent increase, a 9 percent increase in our sales tax. Um, and Mr. Lashley and I, and maybe all of us, I'm not sure, encouraged her to reduce that to 4.5 percent. My concern is, is it even going to reach 4.5 percent? Mm -hmm. It may not. Um, we're living in a, a scary time. I really want to give the taxpayers some help. They need it. All of us are taxpayers. All of us need that help on our taxes. But at the same time, I don't want to give so much help that we really pay for it in our next year's budget or maybe our six-month review budget. Um, so I'm going to encourage a one penny decrease. I think we can do that from our surplus, Mr. Vines, as you had, had indicated. Um, but I'm afraid to go beyond the one penny at this point. Um, I'm agreeing. I'd like to disagree with it. one of our county commissioners, but I can't. <laughs> I think they're all, all of us are on point, and I think we've got to do that. I uh, am encouraging us to not take a vote tonight until we hear from ABSS. Uh, and with that remark, I'm going to look at all, all our commissioners and see if they have more input. I'll make a motion to that effect. Wait, 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 wait. I just forgot a sentence and <laughs> kept my mouth shut the whole time, <laughs> which is right up there with the red sea. You're, you're, you're now recognized, I Ms. Thank, thank you. <laughs> um, it's about the forensic specialist that um, Sheriff's talking about that I'm supporting three. Um, the SBI would provide the training. They pay for all their expenses, motel, food, whatever, and they also give us the equipment. So that's a biggie. That really is. And um, and to add on to what you were saying, and just one thing, I was listening to a report this earlier in the week of last week that 229 million brand new credit cards had been issued. And that tells me that whenever everybody got their stimulus money from the COVID ferry and they had all these giant <laughs> big screen TVs, washer dryers, it was like Christmas at Walmart. Folks that got that kind of money may have just went and got what they'd always wanted and now they don't have it. And there's one thing about a credit card, when you reach the limit, it says decline. It doesn't say come back tomorrow and we'll help you then. <laughs> it says decline and they're talking about how many folks are living on plastic. That is dangerous because that alludes to crime when you don't have the money. It just goes in everything. And the sales tax <coughs> may be off the charts, but that's because the prices are off the charts. 50 bucks to fill up my Honda. How dare somebody do that to me? But I got to go. And so I just, I just really think housing is over the chart expensive. I told my husband, I said, we could sell our house right now and we could make all this money and we could get a camper. <laughs> and me and Craig and a camper, we would have to have a warehouse, put the camper beside, put all our stuff in it. So it's just, if you sell it and make a lot of money, you're going to get stuck with it when you try and buy something new. So there's no win in this. So I just, um, there's just so much that we're looking at that's just slapping us in the face. This inflation, I mean, it's very, very scary. And when I hear 118 vacancies, schools have had vacancies before, but I don't think I've had them like that. And if you're not in the classroom, you either got a teacher or children. That is the definition of school, plus the bus driver. He's got to get you there. <laughs> but you can't have one or without the other. And uh, we've seen um, detrimental circumstances and outcomes on what our kids have gone through. And if we don't focus on them with their behavior and their mental health, you know, and the family, the family is so broken and divided 
And um, I mean, it's, it's, it's just a playground for the devil. So that was it. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Just Mr. Mr. Um, you know, John, I got so much stuff going through my head right now. I'll be the last person you want to talk to, <laughs> uh, because I, I just, I just, like I said, I know so much about the budget. I need you to, const I need you to pick out a subject, and then we can start talking. Right. Uh, that's how and in depth I went through this budget. I really, I really like. Steve Carter hit nail on the head. You know, back in February, I knew this budget was going to be a monster. It's going to be a bear, just because of the way the uh, the economy was going, and uh, so I really did do my due diligence. On, on the budget itself, so um, I just like I said, I know too much about it. That's why, that's why I say you got to sort of narrow it down to what you want to talk about. <laughs> because I'm I'm like uh, like you guys. I just think that we uh, should definitely look out for our taxpayers. Uh, they are the ones who make all this happen, and uh, just make sure that we take care of our schools and um, um, safety and security. That's what seems to be um, running strong right now. So let's take care of that. Thank you. Mr. Turner, anything further? No, thank you. Mr. Carter, anything further? I was just thinking about, Ms. Thompson made a comment. Um, Judy and I really enjoy it. It's a Sunday night TV program, and all of a sudden, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, about, <laughs> it's about. It's, it's the, it's the one with the one room schoolhouse and the uh, valley. And the, the yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a hallmark. I tell you, it's getting really hard to find anything on TV that's worth watching, that doesn't have plenty of foul language or stuff you don't really need to be seeing. But the Hallmark Channel has some good stuff. That's an advertisement, and I don't even get paid for it. <laughs> um, but uh, When Calls the Heart is an interesting program on Sunday nights, and it's just a clean combina combination comedy drama. And you don't like it, Thomas? Okay. <laughs> Um, but there, the, it goes back to the basics, and it's set in the eight, uh, early 1900s, and there's a little one-room schoolhouse, and, the, and the, one of the stars of the show is a teacher in the schoolhouse, and that takes it back to the basics of education, the students and the teacher. I don't mean to imply we don't need you other guys somewhere in there, <laughs> but I kind of sort of almost did, but it really is the, well, the rubber meets the road in that classroom. and. I know Judy taught for 27, I think, 27 years, and uh, I, I, I know more about education than I probably ever wanted to know, but uh, most of it by osmosis. But schoolroom has got to be a safe place for kids. If, if they're not in a safe place, they're not going to learn. And if they're worried about who's coming up to knock on the door every minute after seeing, some of them have been exposed to this news. I know a lot of parents probably kept their children from watching it and uh, that, I'm not sure whether that was wise or not but I'm sure a lot of them did and the last thing you want is kids worried about who's knocking on the door next and what's going to happen next when they're sitting in a classroom we've got to take care of our kids we've got to take care of our citizens I mean it's across the board folks health department is here to take care of our citizens DSS here to take care of our citizens Parks and Rec here to provide recreation for our citizens so they can let off some steam if nothing else so they can let off some steam just get out and have some fun and, um, I mean it just goes on and on the EMS if we didn't have them we'd have more people dying and uh, our rescue squad I know they uh, they uh, that's an amazing group of fellows there that uh, volunteer their time to try and be able to hear when we have the worst event that's ever gonna happen in our life they will show up to make sure we can try to get out of it alive um, I mean, I could just, I'm not going to be able to touch on all of them, but just tons of agency or departments in the county that we really can't live without. And almost every single one of them is struggling to keep and retain and hire and fill vacant positions right now because of competition around the state and around our region. And that's not just competition from other counties and other cities, it's competition from private industry as well. Um, our um, IT department lost uh, one of our crack IT specialists to a to a job in Raleigh where he doesn't have to even and I, I won't go into the details behind it but he doesn't even have to tr commute he works from home and is making a lot more than he was making before and we're struggling to try and replace people like that and let me tell you another problem you don't want us to ever have you don't want our systems to get hacked and those guys Bruce's department are the ones that try and keep us out of that problem. 
I mean, there's no, there's no department we can survive in this county without and without trying to take care of them. Now, all of you might think you'd like to see a cut someplace, but t please tell me where. It's easy to stand up and say, we're spending too much money. Tell me where we ought to cut it. And then look at those people, like we have to look at those people and look at the jobs they have to do every day and the people they have to take care of and look at the work schedule some of them are running just to try and take care of the workload they're dealing with. Sheriff's Department, DSS are two cr uh, critical ones there. So is uh, EMS. Um, I mean, we have agency interagency agreements with other counties so that if our ambulances are tied up, we get ambulance service from outside the county, EMS service from outside the county. Do you want to be the one having a heart attack and your ambulance is coming from Chatham? Orange, Guilford, wherever, instead of Alamance County? I don't think so. So, there's a lot to take care of. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not going to add anything other than to recognize Mr. Carter for the motion that he was about to make. <laughs> okay, you seconded my motion. Uh, you had to make it first. Oh, I thought I did. <laughs> um, I'm, I'll make a motion that we uh, move the vote on the budget until a 20th meeting. Does that require a motion? I don't Martin? think it does, no, I think but, but I'd feel good about a consensus. Second. Any further discussion? Motion on the floor is to uh, move this vote on the budget to our next meeting, which is June 20th. All in favor signify by saying aye. I'll make one amendment. I'll include in that that we require a meeting with ABSS to review their needs in that as well. I don't think we can require them to do that. Well, require us to agree to it. <laughs> I'm looking out there and I think it's going to happen. <laughs> I don't think you need to add that amendment. No. <laughs> All in favor of the original motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion's unanimous. Thank you. And that's 630, right? Yeah. Oh, our next, as Ms. Thompson just indicated, our next meeting again is 6.30 on the 20th, 6.30 p.m. Okay, next item is uh, Ms. Hook, I'm going to recognize you for that matter, Friendship Adult Day Services Request. Sure. I'll just be very brief um, to give a summary and I think Connie is here through Zoom. Um, adult, uh, Friendship Adult Day is requesting $30,000 for continued operations. Um, they completed an application and it has been reviewed. In reviewing the application only the fiscal standing of the agency was considered, not the services provided or any exter uh, extenuating circumstances around the agency or the timing of the request. The agency's main source of funding is through grant, um, reimbursable grants through HCCBG Home Care Community Block Grant. It's a reimbursable grant, therefore revenue is received after services have been provided. They also receive some funding from DSS, which is also reimbursable funding. Friendship Adult Day, from what we can see, started the fiscal year, which would be July 1, 2021 with $80,000 in available cash. The agency was able to open for a few weeks at the beginning of their physical year and they received uh, $7,900 in grant funds for their reimbursable activity. Then the agency closed again to a rise in COVID numbers. When, when was that closed? Um, it's in her timeline and I didn't get okay. the exact date. I can look through it though and give you that date. Yeah, it's August. August. That's what I thought was right all yep. um, After closing the clients, the agency used bank funds to re retain staff with no indication of receiving funding from their usual funding sources since they were reimbursable funding sources. The agency participated in monthly meetings and um, of their grant agencies and reported a short period of reimbursable activity. By mid-year, the agency would have been able to see additional funds would not be available. And at that point, it was an opportunity for the agency to take fiscal action to ensure that there were enough funds available to begin operations once they were able to open again. 
So based on that financial information, the information that was submitted and only based on that, staff is not recommending funding at this time. Do you have anyone else that needs to speak regarding this matter? I would like to speak, John, if that's okay with y'all. All right, Ms. Moore. This is Connie Moore. Yes, ma'am. Um, we, uh, what Sherry has said is is basically true, um, and and they weren't looking at any other extenuating circumstances, and we understand that. However, when we finally did move in January, we were financially sound, and would have been able to open up had the state certification gone as we had expected, not only us, but the Department of Social Services here in Alamance County as well. It was that lag once we were in the new building and ready to open that has put us in this position. Um, we had the money to open. If we could have opened up March 1st, as we thought was gonna happen, we would have been fine. We would never have come to y'all for any help. Um, because of that lag in that time, and that was also due to COVID, they were short staff at the state level. Um, there were things that were not, we were not aware of at either at the DSS level here or our level that were going to be needed to be changed that had been grandfathered in for years. Um, we basically had to redo all of our policies and procedures to change verbiage and words and include things that we had been grandfathered out of before. Once we got a clear picture of what was going to happen, we did it immediately, but we were still, when we came to y'all in April, we had not even seen DASS in the building yet from Raleigh. Um, when they came right after that first meeting that we came to here, um, we were told to do a contract with Sherry. We got with Sherry for two weeks. We worked on a contract. Um, we came back with that contract and we were told something else and we went back for that. We got our certification on May 2nd and we opened on May 2nd. Uh, we had everything ready to go waiting on the state and I finally actually had to call someone at the state level that I knew to let them know what was happening to us here to move that along fast enough to get us open. Um, we did receive um, a $10,000 donation and a $10,000, what was then termed a loan, which became a donation. So the $50,000 that we had originally asked for then became $30,000. And it's basically, we have just turned in, we could not hire the additional other position that we needed because we didn't know about the funding and we could not add any additional folks onto the rolls until we knew we were certified. So we've got 10 new people trying to come in. We've got two on board now. We've got four people that we're interviewing for that position so that we'll have the numbers that we have to maintain for the state certification. Um, we're at the point now where we have got um, probably enough money left to pay my folks through the end of this month. Um, and we will not get reimbursed until the middle or end of next month after the pay period. So that's the situation that we're at. We kept our folks on back in August when we closed. We had been told that we were going to be moving at the end of September. Due to COVID, that thing kept getting pushed out. Every time we got close to a move date, it got pushed out to the next month. I only had three people working for me out of the five that normally work with me. We did not put those other, we lost two people during that time and we did not put them back on. We spent that time packing all of our stuff up, getting all of our stuff ready for the moves. And we just kept moving and kept moving and kept moving. And when we finally moved in January, we had enough funding to keep us solvent until we started getting reimbursed in um, April. But then we couldn't move. We couldn't do anything until the middle of the 1st of May was before we could open. So that's what's put us in this position we are known for pension every penny till it screams. We have done more with less for years. Um, we are fiscally responsible and have always been. Um, I have asked Sherry for a written statement as to our, the denial of funding for us. Um, I've yet to receive that. I'm sure she'll get it to me. We really appreciate you guys coming to the grand opening last week. 
Um, it was wonderful for the county, for the citizens of the county, as Mr. Petrie had said. Um, but we're in a position now that we we need some a further injection of some funding to keep us solvent and keep us serving the people that we serve, which are the elderly and disabled of Alamance County who deserve the same rights as everyone else. Um, we do show outcomes. We have had to do that with every grant. Everything we get, the reimbursement she's talking about, those are grant funds that we have to file for every year. Not only did we get it again this year, but they gave me a $12,000 increase because of the work we have done. So we will be able to draw down more funding this year than we've ever drawn down. But we have to be open to do that. So I just wanted to, to speak to y'all once more just to let you know that what we do in this community makes a huge difference for the citizens that do it. A couple of folks on this, on this commissioners know that because they serve on the boards that, that fund us through those money. That money has to come through the county and be approved for us. Um, we had no trouble, and I'm, I'm sure I think Pam was at that meeting. We had no trouble getting that extra money from them because they know that we are fiscally responsible and that we do have the outcomes that we're supposed to have. So I just wanted to, to make that last um, plea to you to, to look at the citizens of this county that we serve and what we do every day and what a difference it makes in their lives and what a difference it would make if it wasn't there. Because that's what we're looking at. Thank you. Ms. Thompson, do you have questions? Um, I, I just, I, from the very beginning, I've supported this agency because I know the fine work that they do. This is a very selective type of um, nonprofit that does really difficult work. The people that work there have built long-lasting relationships with this population. Ms. Thompson, please uh, ask questions for okay. us. You must come back to comments. I don't please. have any questions for Connie because uh, she's answered all my questions. I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry. No problem. Mr. Lashley. No, I have no questions. Mr. Turner. No. No. I do have questions. One, you gave us a packet, or didn't give to me, you gave to the administration a packet of materials, correct? Yes, we did. All right. The articles of incorporation that you gave us went away in 2005. No, they were redone in 2005. They were redone in 2005, but the copy you gave us was the pre-2005 articles of incorporation. Why did you not give us current articles of incorporation? At the time that y'all were asking for them, we were redoing the, the articles of incorporation. There was a letter that went with that that stated that it was not, it is still in place. There was a letter that came with that from the state of North Carolina. You gave us a um, verification of your 501c status, but you gave us a 2004, actually, 19 whatever when you were formed 1981 yes articles of incorporation why did you not give us a current copy of your articles of incorporation because they have not changed they were passed in 2005 as the same thing was <laughs> what you're looking at john is the same thing it was approved again in 2005 it was not changed In 2020, you filed a 990, but you only, gave us, you only gave us the cover page. Why did you not give us the entire packet? That was a mistake, and Sherry came back and asked me for it. When I sent it, I thought the whole thing had come. It had not, and I re-sent it to her and gave her all of it. That document, I went online. You can pull it offline, by the way. Uh, yes, you can. That you had a uh, reserve. Uh, at the end of that year of $92,700 some odd dollars. What happened to that money? What year is that, John? That would have been the year ending in 2020. In the year ending in 2020, that was the year that we closed for COVID. That would have been in July. That is correct. So what, what happened you to the $93,000? The 92000 is what Sherry's talking When Sherry mentioned the 88 when we started, that's where that came from. What we close out in June of 2020 is what we have to show on the 990. 
our year runs through there, but we don't get reimbursed and we don't pay bills until July. So that all has to come back out the next year. So you have to look at every single year to see what the totals are. What happened to the $93,000? It was spent when we opened back up. You spent not, what did you spend? No, they were, all of my staff was laid off in 2020 except myself. I went after the PPP loan to pay for my salary for eight weeks because that was the extent of what everybody thought was going to happen at that point. After that, we started getting and we started getting funding through a waiver program, which was a reimbursement for us calling and working with all of our clients, even though they weren't coming in. That money was used to pay for all of our other expenses that don't stop. Employees are not your only expense. We still had all the stuff, all the insurances, all of that had to be paid. My salary had to be paid after the PPP ran out for me to continue doing the grants and continue getting the waivers and the money coming in. And then when we reopened again in May of 2021, we went back to getting our regular reimbursement at a much lower rate because we'd lost about half of our participants and were not allowed to add anyone back during that time. Of course, that, you know, you couldn't do that. So we were starting to build up our, our participant levels again. We were taking, we were starting to take um, interviews with people that were wanting to come in. And at that time, Omicron and Delta hit and people said, it's not a good time to start bringing folks in. So we waited it out for a few more weeks and then found out in August that we were gonna have to close again. And at that point we were down to, I believe Sherry quote, told you how much it was. I don't have those papers in front of me right now, and I'm at home, not at work. But anything, you, if you would like to put those questions in writing, I'd be glad to answer them for you. You're the director of that agency, is that correct? I am. One of your primary duties is to raise funds and go out and raise funds for this agency, is that correct? No, actually it's not. Fundraising is a, is a part of what I do. The rest of it is making sure that we are keeping our folks safe, that we are abiding by all the rules of our grantors, that we're doing all the reports that have to go in to make sure that that's done, that all the outcomes, the inputs, the outputs, all of that is done correctly so that we can continue to get funding. I also do fundraising, and we have done fundraising in other years when we needed to. As a nonprofit, we do not hold more than two to three months of um, in reserve funding because we use every dime we get in to pay for the folks that are there. And just to let y'all know, the reimbursement rate is nowhere near what it costs to do this. So we have to go after other grants and do fundraising to make up the difference, and we do that every year. But we did not do it in 2020, and we did not do it in 2021 because of a pandemic that nobody knew was coming or how long it was gonna last. It was just like, you know, the moves. It was nobody's fault. The pandemic caused all of those delays in the building and the trades and all of that. It was nobody's fault. The pandemic, you couldn't get the stuff. You couldn't get the people. And it just kept happening month after month. But we were working the entire time. We were still calling all of our folks. We were still getting them resources. We were still getting them legal advice. We were doing everything we would do if they were there, except them being there. We were sending activities to their homes. We were going through 40 years worth of our stuff to get it ready to move when we could move. We were shredding years of documents that had to be shredded. We were pl planning all the activities and putting together those packets for them so that when we did open, we'd be ready to hit the ground running. Board, I don't have any other questions at this point. I'm ready to make a vote. Anybody else have any questions or comments? I just have a simple comment, what I was saying a while ago. Um, this is such a, t this is just, a real cluster um, and it's it's just real disappointing that this has happened um, there is no misappropriating funds there is no embezzlement there's no laws broken there's just another COVID victim 
and this agency seems to be one. Like so many other nonprofits that have closed their doors, small businesses have closed their doors and not rebounded. And that's the shame of it. Um, I hope we've learned a lot of valuable lessons from a pandemic on how to really deal with it, if that's even possible. Um, but the thing about it is, is I, if, if this agency fails, we're going to fail a lot of people. A lot of people that might not have another way out when it comes to socialization, being with other people, doing things to really stimulate them and get them have a really safe, secure place to go while all along the person that cares for them all the time is able to work and everything. You know, I really worried about um, a certain population that we have in school whenever they were out as far as that have um, all kind of physical problems and um, just name it. It's a certain curriculum that a, a student can go to our school up to 21 years old. And I thought this parent even have a nurse that has to touch their feeding tube. I mean, the one thing, all, just all kind of stuff. And I thought, well, how is that going to be the stress level on that family when they're used to having that eight hours a day where they know without a shadow of a doubt that those professionals are taking care of them. They're in school. It's so healthy for him. And it's kind of the same thing for this. We've watched and listened to folks come in here and plead for this agency. And, I, and I, you know, and John, I respect everything you're saying because you're really asking the questions, and we have to do that. But at the same time, it, it kind of gets me when we're at a grand opening, cutting a ribbon for an agency that the building was built for by the sweetest man who told us everything <laughs> on a hot day. He was priceless. I, I just loved him, Mr. Petrie. You just, that's just such a patriot. And we're out there talking about this and the possibility of the main core of why that building was built might have to leave. And, um, and it it's really says a lot about character. And, and I know sometimes there are rules, there are Ten Commandments and we don't follow them, but there are rules that, and policies in place and we're supposed to honor that because it's like the planning board and all kind of other stuff. I made the quote Friday when I met with them. If we're going to have these laws and we're going to have these policies and the ordinances, we are going to follow them or we'll just forget it. And, and I understand that too. I think this, the timing of all this has been a nightmare for anybody, especially this particular population. And I cannot in good faith not find a way to help them financially to get over this hump so that because this is a reflection of a lot of things um, and what Craig was talking about where does that money go you know trust me there are a lot of nonprofits that have been caught there have been a lot of other things that have been caught from misappropriating funds um, and it's very very serious but I don't think any of this has been intentional I don't think any of this has been that and I just think as human beings that are very fortunate with our health that we realize that there are some that are not and as a community we need to think about doing something somehow to keep their doors open because we are going to pull the rug out from a lot of people that in dire straits that need this for 40 years I don't know many businesses other than Zach's that's been in business <laughs> for 40 years and um, so I, I just really want us to think about this and I understand both sides of this I really do but um, the nonprofit part of me that's worked and had to get a dime out of a nickel and basically stand out on the street with cardboard will work for donations. I mean, I just, I just know what that's like. And you don't really fundraise during a pandemic. You don't really do nothing except pray to God you're going to get back and get your life back and get your life and have it. So that, that's all I've got to say. And y'all know this. I've, I've said this all along and I, my feelings have not changed any. Thank you. Mr. Lashman. Well, you know, I, I sympathize with the challenges and the difficulties that contribute to running a nonprofit. I mean, it is difficult. Yeah. It is super difficult. And when something like this happens, it's just, I mean, it's just, it's a kick in the, you know, it's a kick in the gut. But how I started off with this was asking a simple question and then trying to answer that question. And that question was, what are the fundamental purposes of the county government? What am I responsible for as a county commissioner? And, you know, I just think that the, I'm responsible f for county government that provide vital and essential services such as uh, law enforcement, uh, DSS, uh, school system. There's a lot of things. That, and, and I just, this is just one of those things that I don't believe that I, as a county commissioner, that this is what I'm supposed to do. I don't, I don't think I'm supposed to... Uh, 
I don't think the taxpayers want me to be <coughs> taking care of nonprofits. Um, that's just my personal opinion. I don't think they want me to do that. Now, I understand that this group does a lot of good things. The only thing I was really concerned about is I don't really, I mean, I only see 18 people that they're working with. That's all I see. Now, if you got to see something else, let me know. But, you know, just looking at it from a, just a strictly what is the fundamental purposes of my job, I don't, I'm not, I don't think I'm supposed to be taking care of nonprofits. That's just where I, that's just where I have come down to. Thank now, you. I'll be more than happy to, uh, once they uh, get up and running, I hope they will call me. I'll be more than happy to donate. Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, let me start by saying I, I believe in the mission of Friendship Adult Day Services, and I believe that the folks who work there, Ms. Morris and others, are dedicated to that mission and are fine, upstanding citizens, and I don't think they've done anything wrong. But I, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Um, and I, I do think that it would be a shame if they close and they don't have to close. Um, this A prior iteration of this board um, put some money aside with the pandemic relief funds for for this very purpose, for, for small businesses and for nonprofits who have been hurt by COVID and who have had trouble making ends meet as a result of COVID and make available $25,000 loans at low interest rates um, for that purpose through the self-help group. Um, and I think that, that this is the perfect example of, of what those funds were designed to do. We've given out a lot of those funds. A lot have been paid back, which allow more funds to be used to keep afloat small businesses and nonprofits who are affected by COVID. Um, that would be a great resource for, for the group. Uh, obviously, United Way, Impact Elements have emergency fundings available from a grant perspective. Um, that would be a great source. But if you can get the $25,000 the low interest loan, it's not a bank. It's self, well, I guess self-help is a type of bank, but it's through, a, through the funds that we've designated low interest. If you can get that, you stay afloat, you $5,000 short. Um, do some fundraising. I mean, I appreciate Mr. Lash is saying he'd contribute. I'll help him raise funds. I mean, we, we can get behind this group and do this in a way that doesn't have to involve the taxpayers getting directly involved in a, in a nonprofit and having to pick winners and losers about which nonprofit is des deserving of, of saving from the, and which is, is not. And I think it's dangerous when we do that. But there's a way to get this done, and I'm happy to have conversations about it, and I think we've identified some of those here today. So, Mr. Thank you. Well, I've actually talked to the folks at Small Business Center at ABS, ACC and the uh, that represent Self Up Credit Union in this loan situation. And Ms. Morse made a comment to the individual I had contact her that they couldn't repay a loan. So, and I understand that perhaps, Ms. Morse, that you don't see that you can repay the loan from your revenue sources. Um, We've had a couple of defaults on that program. John and I, I think John and I both attend the, the uh, committee meetings for that loan group, and uh, not many defaults. It's been, it's, it's been a good program so far. It's helped several businesses out, a number of businesses in the local community. Um, I think you might want to look at your numbers, and I mean, 25,000 is the maximum loan. It's a very low interest rate. Um, rethink the ability to whether or not you can repay it and uh, and uh, have a conversation with the folks at self-help uh, from from a more positive perspective of yes we can try to figure out a way to repay this and I agree with what uh, uh, Bill and Craig both said and I'm sure Pam and I'm confident John would get behind it we'll help you self we'll help you raise the money the difference the five thousand dollars that you need um, but uh, that's the, I think that's, I agree with the rest of the commissioners that have made comments about the, uh, our responsibility. Now, I will add ARP funding, am I not correct, doesn't ARP funding allow for us to give funds to 501c3s who've suffered? Is that not a possibility with current ARP funds? And we have nothing left from the COVID funds, right? That would be for county purposes. The federal government purposes. allows uh, donations to. Beg pardon? The federal government would allow, and the ARP legislation would allow it, but state law does not. 
Yeah, that's the rub. That's the rub. I knew it was one, but I couldn't remember which one it was. Um, I mean, that. John, can I say something again, please? Just a second. Do you mind? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, Steve's right. We did talk with those folks, and we did go over our numbers. Um, to to say that we just said we couldn't do alone. It was it took hours, and we went through. Like I said, we already run at a deficit. The cost of, of caring for someone in the state of North Carolina in in a resident in a situation like ours is about sixty five dollars a day. We keep that down to $51 a day, which we just went up this past two years because of the cost of everything rising. We had to go up from 47. We only get reimbursed $42 a day from Home and Community Type Block Grant and only $33 a day from DSS. So we are already raising funds to meet the needs that we have. And they felt like, just as we did, that it would be fiscally irresponsible to go into a loan on top of that. So that is why we did not go with that suggestion. We, we appreciate y'all letting us know it was out there and we did talk with them, but that is why we did not go after it because we are already having to make up the difference. Now, the state of North Carolina and federal government have, have always had a cap on what we could get reimbursed and that cap has been lifted now. And so we are hoping for the first time in fiscal 22-23 to actually get reimbursed at the rate it cost us. At that point, which will be sometime down the road in August, September, then we would be on, on firmer ground. But not now. It would not be responsible for us to sign for a loan right now. It would just put us further into to debt. So Thank you. We, we, did, we did do that. Mr. Petrie uh, gave the county a grant, or actually gift and we built the building and one third of the building has been turned over to your agency for use so you have a facility that's being paid for by the county and or by mr petrie we're maintaining it um so you're I, guys board i'm going to vote against this she already has a twenty thousand dollar gift and she's asked us to repay that um, and we by law cannot repay that to the two ten thousand dollar gifts would be violating no, we're not. if we did that uh, additionally uh, I'm going to move at this point that we deny any further funds to Friendship Adult Day Services Inc. Do she, I have a second? She hadn't actually asked us to refund or to repay those loans her current request no. is thirty thousand dollars. I'm moving that we deny further monies to them, other than we have in our budget, by the way, some matching funds for grants. And I will not include those matching funds that we give as the county taxpayers. I'm not asking that that be terminated. But I'm asking that this request for fifty thousand dollars or thirty thousand or whatever it happens to be today is denied. That is my motion. I'll second that. You guys want to vote on it? I'll second. Yeah, motion to second. Any other comments from commissioners? All in, all in favor of the denial of the further funds signify by saying aye. 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 No. All, in, all opposed say no. No. So it's four to one that we deny the funds. Thank you. John, I thank you all for taking time to look at this and I appreciate you making this official that this is the end of, of coming to the county with this request. I would ask that we receive something in writing because it will, we'll need that when we go looking for funds in other places. I'd appreciate if y'all could get something to us. Ms. Morris, it'll be in our minutes and you can present our minutes to whomever you wish. Thank, Thank you, you very much.
Okay, DSS. Thank Good you. evening, commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Just wanted to come before you to request two budget amendments, both are in regards to our energy programs, both of which are on your agenda. The first one is going to be in regards to our low income energy assistance program. We have received some additional funding that will allow us to provide supplemental payments to those that have previously received a LEAP payment um, in this last current fiscal year. Um, so we're just asking for the line to be amended to put in those funds so that we can actually issue those payments to those um, eligible families. And I understand there's no county match. There is no county match for those Motion funds. to approve. Second. second. Oh. Mr. Turner did the second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. I think you're up next. I am. The second one is in regards to our Share the Warmth um, program. This has been an extensive program this year. Lots of donations have come in, more so than I have ever seen um, coming into the agency. So that is donations that are made through um, energy portals where customers make payments, and then those funds are allocated to additional um, counties based upon population and need. Um, so at this time, we have received notification that we are receiving an additional 280 $2,887.04. There's no county match. Again, we just need to have that budgeted amount adjusted. That line has already been established early on in the original budget process. And again, there's no county match. There is no county match. Thank you. So, we'll do a second. Yes, ma'am. First and second. Like <laughs> How do you really feel about that? <laughs> Any comments? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Um, any opposed? Is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now, the lady that's been sitting here forever, <laughs> you are next. You might want to mention the change in the procedure for the next meeting. Thank you. Okay, hold on one second before we start the clock. Yeah. Uh, you have three minutes. Yes. Uh, it does not have to be on topic. And Mr. Horn, you said... I just thought it might be appropriate at this point to make a comment about the change in procedure. I know it was in the consent agenda, but at, in the future, both agenda comments and non-agenda comments will be at the one public comments period at the beginning, so that if you're in this situation where you wanted to say something, you won't still be sitting here two hours later waiting to say it <laughs> if you wanted to get up and leave. So. Okay. And Thank additionally, you. instead of five minutes, it's now three minutes across the board. Yeah. Yes. We're trying to be consistent. Okay. okay, we will now give your name and address and then we'll start the clock. Okay, Thank my you. name is Mia Bosna and I'm at 1616 Bancroft Court in Graham. Bruce, is that mic on? Yep. Okay. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to present this. Um, uh, I'm here with tonight with the hopes that you'll consider putting in place an ordinance that just prevents um, <coughs> Thank you. Invasive bamboo from being planted um, and hold um, anyone who'd like to plant this um, uh, responsible for containment of it. Um, I share a property line with uh, two neighbors who are aware of this issue. I've been in commu communication with them and there's been an agreement uh, that the bamboo is a nuisance, but there's no guarantees this uh, issue will be resolved. Uh, the plant, um, bamboo plants run these roots called rhizomes that can grow underground for up to 20 feet from the main plant. If left alone, they travel under driveways, patios, house foundations, and even through cracks in concrete floors, such as sheds and garages. The code enforcement officer, Chris Reynolds, was kind enough <coughs> to look at this situation and inform me there isn't much that can be done other than to show up here tonight and uh, ask if you would consider putting this on the nuisance issues that can be enforced. Um, in this packet that I have, if you want copies of it, I have um, some of the other um, <coughs> uh, state and government uh, agencies such as the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture, North Carolina Forest Service, South Carolina Exotic Pest um, Plant Council, 
uh, and a uh, joint initiative by California Academy of Sciences and National Geographic that all um, uh, look at this uh, as an invasive uh, plant species and it's on um, all these different websites. So to the north and to the south of here, uh, there are other states and counties that have put in place ordinances to prevent this. So I have some copies of one or two of those and some links. I don't know if these are of any interest, but I have copies uh, for you to look at. Um, and this isn't a matter of a, uh, uh, a volunteer um, plant that just gets blown in by the wind. Everybody's got that. Everybody has that kind of thing. This is a situation where you have 20 feet of roots that are starting to come up into your property. Um, right now, I would have to dig up an entire garden. I'm afraid it's going to come up through my, um, through the base of my patio in my house. Uh, I have uh, paid people to cut this down, um, but the responsibility is on me now. So I consider this a, a nuisance since it's trespassing, and um, it's also if you spilled a toxic material and it went over into your neighbor's things, it's also a cleanup issue. So I consider it pretty equal with that. Okay, anyway. And we thank you. Thank you. I had no idea. I had no idea about bamboo. I'm just thinking of bamboo fishing pole. I had no idea how <laughs> many That's what it it's was. called, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, it, it, uh, it looks beautiful, but it actually prevents any natural indigenous species of North Carolina plants from growing. Wisteria is real pretty too, but it can be a hot mess. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank you. Just, Thank you. Just a quick response, Mr. Chairman. I, I will say that uh, I will agree with uh, Ms. Bosna. That stuff is that stuff is awful. I had to declare all-out biological and chemical warfare against some bamboo in my backyard about two years ago, and yeah, uh, yeah it was it was very very difficult. Well, this is the thing. It takes about three years, and you have to do it at yeah. certain timing, and it goes into groundwater. So yeah. we're drinking glyphosate right now yeah. by having this stuff days. popping up everywhere. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any of the county commissioner comments on this speaker? Yeah, if not, um, Ms. Hook, county manager's report. I don't have anything to report today. All right. Is, um, before we adjourn... No, we have commissioner's response. I'm sorry, comment. forgive me. I'm trying to follow. <laughs> I'm messing you up. I'm sorry. Okay. Commissioner's comments. Ms. Thompson? Okay. Um, just bear with me. I'm going to um, make a big announcement, and I have to really prepare to do this, but I'm going to make this announcement. My announcement is not to offend anyone or hurt any feelings. I am not capable of doing that. I do not undermine people. I do not, I just, I'm just trying my best to be a good person every day when I wake up. So I'm just going to read this, and I'm going to look at it. I'm not going to look at any of you, uh, because it's just very difficult for me. Um, I wanted to take this opportunity to clear something up. Back in 2020, when I was running for commissioner, one of my focuses was on expanding veteran services. I had spoken with Congressman Mark Walker about how I could bring something to Alamance County for our veterans. I was on Mark's Hope Commission, so I knew him personally. He told me to call and set up a time at his Greensboro office. I met with his military liaison, Corey Spohr, and he told me about the Servant Center in Greensboro. I called and set up a meeting and toured this site. It is a nonprofit and they provide many services for vets including transitional housing, counseling, court advocacy, and more. It is awesome. I then scheduled an appointment to get to tour the new Kernersville VA. I had recently taken the FBI Citizens Academy in Raleigh and I met Forsyth County Commissioner Fleming L. Amin. He'll kill me for showing this. We were friends, and so I contacted him, and I asked him to meet me there at the Kernersville VA so I could get answers to questions concerning the county's part in the build. He came and took the two-hour tour with us. Cindy McGilvery from Veterans Service Office went with me. I'm married to a lawyer, and he tells me to always have a witness. This place was off the chart. It has 400,000 square feet of outpatient health care for veterans and was built in 2016, and it cost over $130 million. No telling what the cost would be today. A New York-based group paid $9.6 million to build, to buy the 39-acre site. 
the VA chose Lend Lease Healthcare Development of Palm Beach, Florida. They were responsible for buying the land, building the center, and leasing it for 20 years. The VA pays an annual rent of $13 million. This is for day services, not overnight. The Salisbury and Durham VA are nearby for overnight and more intensive services. This did not cost the taxpayers in Kernersville or Forsyth County anything. No tax increase, no bond. Well, of course, I wanted something like this for Alamance County, but that was impossible due to the close proximity to other DAs, VAs. During 2020, 2020, the Republican candidates went to Raleigh to film a video for all of our candidates for the 2020 election. I was fortunate to ride with John and Joyce Paisley. I was telling them all about the Kernersville VA with big excitement, and John was real quick to help educate me that the Alamance County citizens would not pay for something like this. I then told him how it didn't cost Kernersville or Forsyth County taxpayers. It was all through the VA. I repeated that it was free. Focus on the word free. This is where I think the confusion has come in, and it was revealed in mine John's conversation after our last commissioner meeting, and I'm so glad we got this clear. And after no way possible of having another Kernersville VA, I searched and found Veterans Community Project in 2021, and as you know, I went to visit this site in Kansas City on August 4th and 5th of last year, along with Brian Haygood and Tammy Crawford. It is a nonprofit and focuses on transitional housing for our homeless veterans and has on-site referrals for all kinds of services for vets. They raise their own money and their communities are all over them with financial and in-person support. They're starting their fifth build out of eight across America and I so want them to come here for us to be one of these eight. They are not in government, county or city budgets. They are not taxpayer funded. They have been in People Magazine, Country Living Magazine, Military Publishes, and have received all kinds of awards. All of their leadership is veterans. It was started by veterans. Their CEO, Brian Meyer, once out of the military, went to law school and now is an attorney leading this huge nonprofit. They are not taxpayer funded. While we were there, Brian Haygood and I thought with all of the art money that was coming to Alamance County, we could possibly use some of it to bring this amazing project here. Well, John and I had a conversation in the parking lot after our last meeting concerning Friendship Adult Day Care Center and Veterans Community Project. It has been stated about VCP, Veterans Community Project, several times at our meetings that they had originally said that they were free, and then now all of a sudden it cost $6.5 million. This is just simply not true. Brian Haygood had mentioned in a commissioner meeting report following the January visit from VCP here that it was $6.5 million and could be funded, could be, if chosen, with ARC money. This is where this is going to have to be cleared up. The part about thinking Veterans Community Project was free is just incorrect. VCP leadership Jason Kandar, Ben Hendershot, and Vincent Morales came here this past January 2022 to meet with leaders of Alamance County for two days. John had asked VC President Jason Kandar in this very room, who is also an attorney and also former Secretary of State of Missouri, how much this project might cost and at the meeting. They suggested a price at the first meeting when they were here in January and he gave a high cost of $8 million. After visiting the possible build site on Graham, Hopedale Road across from the health department, which is land that our county owns, with, meeting, with meetings with leaders of City Burlington, it was estimated that the cost would be $6.5 million to build the 30,000 square foot community center and 25 to 30 tiny houses all furnished which also would include two years of budget, 1.5 million each year. This is a one-time cost paid with ARC money if it ever happened, and VCP is never to be part of the county's annual budget nor taxpayer funded. Unfortunately, from John and my conversation in the parking lot, we figured out that there was confusion with the building process of the Kernersville VA, no tax increase, no bond for South County, which the free world, which the word free, had gotten into relations with VCP. The main and only reason I wanted this explained and cleared, because all four of these men I highly respect, is simply because I wanted to protect the integrity and good name of VCP. They have been totally upfront from the first minute I met them in Kansas City. This confusion has, seems to also have caused some tension with Alcovets, and it should not. Alcovets serves Alamance County with excellence in providing emergency services such as overnight motel stays due to a, a crisis utility bills, food, transportation to a medical appointment, and other great things. And just like VCP, Alcovets raises their own money. 
Fortunately, Alcovets recently received a gift of $85,000 due to the advocacy of our Senator Amy Gailey and Representative Dennis Rydell from the state of North Carolina. BCP provides homeless veterans with transitional housing and programs and services to get them permanently back on their boots and become productive citizens. The whole mission of BCP is to get that veteran in a job in his or her own permanent home. You know, some veterans do not come back from war the way they went there, and for whatever reason, their life is shattered and can end up with a severe PTSD, permanent physical injury, drug addiction, crime, living in their car or under a bridge. Sadly, the suicide rate is 22 a day. Regardless if we get this project or not, my goal is, not going, to, is going to be to stop homelessness in our veterans. I have gone to see Top Gun Maverick three times, and it made me even more determined to work for the soldier. I am so glad to be American. Thank you, Craig. I just could see you in the back. You're mm, mm, mm. <laughs> crazy. The military is hard on soldier, and trust me, it's hard on the family. I hear morale is, is down. I cannot stop working for these homeless soldiers that once raised their hand to defend this great country. Several things have gotten back to me, not so kind, and I just want to say I think the devil has had a field day with miscommunication. Any kind of strife and division, I'm going to give him full credit. When Alcovet's president and Graham City Councilman, Mr. Bobby Chen, who is awesome, came to the last meeting, and I believe he spoke out of order for the meeting's agenda, that I could give a flip, but he felt like he had to tell us that Alcovet's took someone to the VA in Durham and give us five commissioners an Alcovet sticker. I knew we had a problem. They have nothing to prove. Alcovet's good name precedes them. At no time should any agency in this county serving and helping veterans feel as though another outside group is going to come and push them aside. Absolutely not. Every single service provided by every single agency is critical, and I will always support them. There is power in unity. So when we pulled up to the Community Veterans Project in Kansas City, and I saw all of the American flags waving on each one of those tiny homes, and when I met the veterans who are leading VCP, and when I heard their own experiences of what happened to them in deployment and coming back home just trying to adjust, and when I heard of suicidal thoughts and attempts, I just knew that I had found my answer for our homeless veterans in Alamance County. I never once thought this would be so difficult, and I'm really sorry. And I just hope this is cleared up any confusion. Thank you. Mr. Lashley. I have not. Richard Hunt. Ethan. Uh, thank you, Pam, for that heartfelt. Mm -hmm. um, I'm so proud speech. of you just watching that movie. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. My best friend said, now I know why you care so much about veterans. I said, Craig Turner did that. That's amazing. Well, thank you. But it's not about me. But I know. But it um, is. And we've agreed not to interrupt each other. I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> but, but there has been tension, and I think I, com I really commend you for to try to find a way to, to relieve some of that, and I think it has just in the last five minutes. And, and I, that's not to say anybody's at fault, but I think, I think it has. And I would like to suggest a possible path forward on this issue, and that's I've never truly understood the scope of the problem with homeless vets in Alamance County. I've heard a lot of different numbers, and I think we ought to understand that number first. What's the scope of the problem? Before you can say what we need to do to solve it. We, we've been putting some effort recently in, in our citizen boards uh, and, and getting those back up and running just more emphasis, and that maybe we ought to to utilize the Veteran Services Citizen Board to take a deep dive into, into asking questions with the Veterans uh, Department in the county to determine what the true scope of that problem is and then come back to us with some potential solutions. I think we could empower that board. There's two, there's five of seven who are on the board now, so it's got two vacancies. We could fill that uh, and get that board moving in a positive direction. Mr. Carter. Well, I agree. Uh, thank you, Pam. Um, I can tell that was heartfelt. And, uh, um, I felt like something was coming tonight from our conversation this afternoon. <laughs> I, pr 
appreciate your efforts. Um, um, I agree. Um, part of part of what was alluded to in some of the conversations we've had is, as you've just indicated, Craig, is the scope. I mean, we've had some indications from the folks at uh, VCP. Is that correct? That this the scope of this project would be beyond mm -hmm. Alamance County. We'd be dealing with veterans in surrounding counties, maybe even beyond our immediate neighbors. And if that's the case, I think looking at this on a larger level would start out with a group like the uh, board from the, the for the uh, veterans services and include other veterans groups in the discussions and look at what the real numbers look like and then if we're willing to get engaged with it take a look at including our neighboring counties and look at you know that we always want to take care of the citizens of Alamance County it's incumbent upon our citizens to take care of our, their fellow citizens however it's not incumbent upon our citizens to take care of the citizens in our neighboring counties. So if we can get, a, get our arms around what those numbers look like and then engage with our fellow commissioners in, in other counties, uh, I'm, I know that's not something that will happen in, two, in a week or two weeks, but if we can get the, some insight into what those numbers look like, then it might help us know, is the project they're proposing big enough? Is it not big enough? And how can we fund it? And how much is going to come from each participating county? You good? Yeah. All right. You will not find anyone other than myself any more supportive of veterans. My personal family had three family members, my six fifth, sixth, and seventh generation grandfathers were all three in the Revolutionary War. My sixth generation grandfather was a colonel in the Revolutionary War. My seventh generation grandfather was the minister that you see in the Patriot that was the minister carrying the rifle. And I've got a long history. My uh, uh, Lieutenant uh, John Paisley, my grandfather's brother, was the first commissioned officer killed in Guilford County in World War I. Uh, one of my son-in-laws, Army Ranger, he was involved in Somalia, Black Hawk Down the movie, sound familiar? He was one of the Rangers that went in and pulled them out. Have a, and I have such respect for the military and for those that did serve and have been able to serve. Having said that, ARP money is your tax dollars. I don't care what we call it, whether we call it you know, money from heaven or whatever it is, it's our tax dollars. And we cannot spend it 6.5 million, by the way, 6.5 million dollars is higher than the, and I've gone online and done a lot of study. They have never, this agency out of Kansas City has never had a budget of 6.5 million dollars in any year of their existence. They're asking us for more money out of your tax dollars than their entire budget for any single year. That to me is incredible. I don't think Henry Vines wants to spend $6.5 million of his tax money. But as Mr. Turner said, and Mr. Carter, and I think all five of us are saying, hey, this should be a regional issue. It should not be a tax dollar issue. Um, when they, uh, my understanding was early on, this was not going to cost the taxpayers a penny. They need to get out there with the industry and with whatever else and raise funds if they want to have the agency here. The additional problem I have is I know a lot of veterans and they're telling me one wrong location. It needs to be close to one of the uh, medical facilities, which is not in Alamance County. 
It needs to be close to a PX so they can get the sales tax and other benefits. It needs to be close to a base and where more veterans are located. And the additional question they ask me is, why are we doing a regional center to bring in veterans with problems to Alamance County so we can support them? Uh, and I can't answer that question. I cannot. Uh, I am highly supportive of this concept. Ms. Thompson, I would love for this to work, but I cannot vote for your tax dollars to fund it when it's not going to be an Alamance County agency. It's going to be a Kansas City, Missouri, if that comes to fruition, um, and bringing in veterans from any and everywhere. I, ju I just can't spend your tax dollars on that. Let me go to ob uh, the next issue. Our next meeting, June 20th, is a 6.30 p.m. meeting. Um, we have got to pass, by state law, we have to pass our budget before June 30. Um, I am thankful to all five members, I'll include me, uh, at this point um, for postponing that vote to June 20th so that we can get more input uh, from ABSS and ACC and, and the other entities that have a direct impact upon our budget. Um, I would request that you contact various commissioners with your, um, your input. Um, I don't like 9,000 phone calls, but I'm willing to <laughs> put up with it and text. Uh, I sincerely, Ms. Graves, believe that your board and I, my board will have a meeting soon, and if you'll contact me, possibly even tomorrow, yes. uh, and with Ms. Hook and, and your folks, so that we can set that meeting up before our June 20th meeting. Um, and then we'll have a better idea of where we need to spend the money. Um, the ARP issue, and we're talking about um, a lot of money there, but we have a lot of need as well, um, will not be included in our budget on June the 20th. That will be a meeting that will be set up, and I think I've talked to all, every commissioner. Um, if I haven't, I will apologize in advance, but I think I have, that we postpone that ARP decision on the funding until after our new county manager is in place, which will put, uh, place it after July 1st. Uh, we feel like the new county manager, um, and Ms. Hook, you've done such a wonderful job and so much positive input. Um, so Ms. Hook and our uh, new county manager together will give us guidance on how we need to spend the remaining funds that are all the heart monies and where they need, need to be placed. But that will not happen as part of our budget. Um, so don't even go there, please. I'll ask it. Wait on that until after we have our new manager and, and so forth in place. Uh, board, any other discussion? I'll say one, one thing, Mr. Chairman. The rules we just adopted at the beginning of this meeting said that we're not supposed to make motions during commissioner comments, so I'm not going to make a motion. But I would, I would think it would be appropriate for a next meeting to have uh, us consider appointment of the Veterans Services Citizens Board to start doing some inquiries into the scope of veterans homelessness in the county. Yeah, let me address that just for the general population. Um, and Mr. Turner is well aware of this. We are, um, there are a number of vacancies that are pending. Um, we slowed that down a lot because all five of us wanted to slow it down and make sure we uh, appointed uh, people that had input that would be more positive uh, would have uh, better input and so forth for these different agencies. So we've got to address that very, very soon. Um, and we are working on it as we speak. Thank you. Now to address that. Anything else? Nothing else, thank you. All right. Okay, I think we next have our county attorney. Nice. Uh, hello and no report this evening. <laughs> well, that's the best report of all day. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Deborah. Okay. I'm going to make a motion that we adjourn. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you.
Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the County Commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.